We are going to take some time today to do something we've done over the last couple of years, and, and that is talk about vision and what an important topic this is for us. Um, I've got some things from the Word I want to share with you about it, but today is really preparation for next week. You are going to go home today with an assignment and something you're going to do together as a family. As a matter of fact, there's a reason we set up like this, and it's not just you know to do something different, it'll look pretty. It's because we want you to take what you see and hear in this service today and go home to your living room, just like this, and talk as a family over some of these things concerning vision, and writing some things down, doing what the scripture says, write it down, make it plain so that you can run with it. And we're going to talk this morning, first of all, about what a vision list is, how the Lord has dealt with us in our personal lives and in our ministry, how we go about making our own vision lists. We want you, like I said, to take that home and do that. And then next week, we're going to bring those vision lists in here together. So you do not want to miss next week. Say, I will be here next week with my vision list. Okay? You don't want to miss that because what we're going to do is not only go over the vision and the vision list that we have uh, as a church and as a ministry, but we are going to release faith together over your personal and family list, over our list, and we are seeing God do good things with these. And this is not just an empty exercise. There's power in this. So before we get into the word concerning it today, I wanted Sarah to just to walk us through, number one, what a vision list is. Number two, how we break it down and, and how we compile this list and pay careful attention today. And if you've got something to make a note with, I would just sit there today with an open heart. And let the Lord speak to you. And if there's something he says to you right here in this environment, in this atmosphere of faith that he wants you to release faith for in the coming year, then make a note of that, write it down. And then, like I said, bring it back next week and we're going to pray over it together. Sarah, would you go ahead and, and talk to us about this? Lead us in this. So vision list, vision Sunday. Has anybody started writing their vision list yet this year? Oh, it's go. so exciting. Right. I know I can tell every day, week after week, I start getting from the Lord things. I start to hear things on the inside to put and to add to our vision list. But, you know, more than even the things that we are desiring and wanting to see God do in our personal lives, the most important thing is that we would gain a heart for his kingdom and his things, a heart for his house. And oftentimes people put their own things first in life. They put their own finances first. They put their own um, uh, desires, their own, the, the, the things that they want and desire for their family. They think about that all the time, and it shows up in every area of life. But the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, to seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things, these extra things, are to be, will be added to us. And the thing is, we, are nev we were never meant to seek after things. We were meant to seek his kingdom. Amen. We were meant to seek him. And sometimes it's so easy for these priorities to get um, out, of, out, of, out of the right order. And so I think the, um, the thing we want to do here with our vision list is not just write all the things that we desire personally, but to start out, number one, um, by putting the kingdom of God first. What will we sow into the kingdom this year? And you may want to make note of this because it's something, and we probably have this screen. Um, do we could put this up on the screen as well? But what you would like to sow into the kingdom this year? What are the things that God is putting in your heart to do for the kingdom this year? And oftentimes I'll put an amount that I'd like to go further beyond what we've ever sown before and to, to press past a boundary right. uh, or a limitation that has held on to us. It's been the, the biggest that we could give, but to give out further. And every year we endeavor to go past in our giving what we've done before. And this is just God's way is to increase us every year more and more. So we do put numbers in this, what we'd like to sow into the kingdom. You know what I also put on here, what I'd like, to, what God is dealing with me to do for the kingdom of God. I, I, I put all kinds of things in here, and, and, and I'm not going to go through all this today, but for each one of that, us, that's different. And every one of us should be uh, seeking first his kingdom, first and foremost in our life. And what does that look like in the practical everyday things? You know, 
you should have a ministry unto the Lord. What is your ministry unto the Lord? It is how you serve God with your everyday life. And it may look different for every person in here, but you and I should seek the Lord continuously to find out where it is that we serve and love his people, where it is that we serve and love him, where, what he's, he called us to do, what is our purpose in life. And so that would be our first thing. You know, what I did when I made my first vision list, I made my first one back when I was in high school, I believe, junior high or high school. And I put a, I had a huge poster board and I put every, I put, I just cut out pictures of magazines. Back then we didn't really use the internet like we <laughs> use today. I'll tell you how old I am. But, um, we would just cut out pictures out of magazines and put them in our vision board. I had pictures of me marrying this dark headed, good looking guy. <laughs> Sure enough, I mean, he looks just like the picture that I put on my poster board. I had only better, only be way better. Um, I had, I had pictures of um, just the things that I desire to do for the kingdom. I had, I wanted at that time, I desired to lead worship for children's ministry, and so I had a picture of a bunch of kids and a piano, and I would, see, you know, my desire was to sing and lead people into the presence of God. And so I would put all that on my vision list. I wanted a Jeep Cherokee. That was like my dream car back then. You know, when you're when you're 14, 15. I mean, that was that was pretty sweet. Some of you got anybody have a Jeep Cherokee in here? Oh yeah, it's a great car. And so I. I just believe God for a Jeep, and I'm telling you, he was so faithful, and I, I mean, everything on that poster board came to pass in my life, but see, the Bible tells us in Habakkuk chapter 2, it says this, verse 2, the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it, and so to write the vision and make it plain, that is a commandment to God, from God to us, and to write it down, to make sure that we can see it and we can run with it. And so I just started doing that when I was younger. And then I made another vision list um, every year until I got older. And even the year before I met Jeremy, I made a vision list. And, you know, I actually... <laughs> Put a, does anybody know what I'm about to say? Because you don't you can make fun of me. Some of you guys have heard this story. I actually put a picture of Jeremy in my vision book. Now, I do not advise this. To it's, it's, it's a little weird. Sounds a little strange. But I actually had a picture of him in my vision book. And it was, I, I don't, I had... I actually had heard from the Lord about him. <laughs> this, is, this is now sounding crazy. But I, I really, I was actually just using people as an example. I really needed a vision of a man of God uh, in my life because everybody around me, I didn't know anybody that was really serving God and going after God. And so I just happened to put a picture of him in my book. And that's before we knew each other. That's before we had ever met. So all of anybody else in here weird like me? Okay. Um, anyway, all that to say is, you know, the, the, the Bible says that you have not because you ask not. And so many times we're not specific with the things of God and we don't write them down and we don't make it plain. And, you know, you could, you could just be praying but never be specific and never have anything specific. But God delights in giving us the secret petitions of our hearts. That's the things that are deep down on the inside that only he could do for us and no one else could do for us because it gives him so much glory. Yeah. When other people can't do it for you and you can't make it happen on your own and it's God who does it, that gives him the most glory. Amen. So it says, write the vision and make it plain that he who runs, uh, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries or maybe takes a little longer than you think, wait for it because it will surely come. God cannot lie. It will not tarry. Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Hallelujah. So as we just, as the years went by, you know, even that year before I met Jeremy, I wrote down all the things I was believing to do for the kingdom. And that year, the Lord had put in my heart to make an album. And it was the first time I had ever done that. And I had a picture of a recording studio. You know, pictures help some people see very clearly. 
and it helps you dream and it helps you imagine. And I always think about this, you know, vision is just the beginning of walking out everything God has told you by faith. He gives you the vision first. It's the beginning. And then as you begin to meditate on that vision, as you look at it, as you read it, as you begin to, um, you know, just get it down deep in your heart, then the Lord will give you a plan of how to fulfill and accomplish that vision and a strategy on how to do it. And I was thinking about this this week, Jeremiah 29, 11. You know, this is so good. I should probably just read this to you. Um, uh, let's see, I wrote it down in here, but I wanted to tell you, um, you, you know, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Well, also, is that the word thoughts there can also be plans, for I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Um, I love this because when I was studying this, you know, this whole passage, people are telling uh, what well, God is trying to contradict the voices that are speaking into their lives at this time. And people are saying all manner of things. And God is telling them, don't listen to every voice. Don't listen to every distraction. But I know the plans that I have for you and the thoughts that I think toward you. And I know the things I'm imagining in my heart for you. And see, it's a plan. To me, I think of it as we're in the middle of construction right now here. You can see. and to get to this point where we're at now and what's about to happen in the lobby, it has taken a lot of planning. Yeah. And we've had to create a lot of plans for this building to submit to the, uh, to the building department in order to get permits to even start on this journey. And this is part of uh, getting the vision from God. You know, it says that in Habakkuk. Let me just read this to you again. Um, can you put Habakkuk chapter 2, just the very first verse on the screen for everyone? It said the, no, Habakkuk 2, 1. It says, I will stand my watch, and I will set myself on the rampart. Keep going. And watch to see what he will say to me. And what I will answer when I am corrected. And to go before the Lord to find out not only what your desires are, but what his desires are for you. And what his plans look like. What his blueprints look like. You know, God has made a blueprint for every one of our lives. It's a beautiful blueprint that he lays out our days before us, what we should walk in, the things that he's called us to do. But it's up to us to look at those blueprints, to watch and to hear and to seek him for those plans so that those ways can be established in our lives. And as I read that, I thought about um, uh, Proverbs where it says... I'll read this one to you too. Let's see if I can find it. It says basically this that a, a man in his heart devises his ways, makes his own plans, but it's a, the Lord who actually establishes his steps. It's the Lord who makes those things to be settled in his life. And so what you want to do with your vision is just take time to hear from the Lord, to seek the Lord, to watch for him, to find out what he wants for you. So many people just write everything they could possibly imagine, but really you want to find out what God's will is for your life and for your family. And you want to write that down. And then as you go, you want to seek him all along the way. You want to stop and you want to check your heart. And you want to say, Lord, is this your way? Is this your way? And you want to go with him on it. And it may look slightly different than what you saw, but there will be things that are similar. There will be similarities. So um, all I have to say, write down the things, first of all, what you want to sow and give and be a part of in the kingdom. What's your vision for the exciting things that God's called you to do? Second of all, you want to write down all the things that, that you owe 
that you, all your debts, all your obligations, all the things that you need to pay back. And that's part of walking with God is being a good steward over these things. And then believing big, what would we have and what would we do if money were no object? It's so quiet. What would you do? What are the things that, you, that are deep down, those secret things in your heart? I love that about the Amplified Classic version. It says, it says that delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires and the secret petitions of your heart. What are those things that no one else knows about that are secret to only you and to him? Write it down, make it plain, and then continue to seek him over his plan. Then let him give you the strategy to do this vision. Let him give you the plan. Let him give you the way to walk it out. You know, faith is a big, long walk. That's right. And not to think that it's, you know, people give up so quick. They quit on what they're believing for so quick because they don't realize that this is walking and talking with God. Mm -hmm. Faith is a long walk. And it takes patience to inherit the promises. So all that to say, take time to, to feed on what the Lord is showing you, to write it down, make it plain, and then to ta start taking a step. Every day, we should be taking a step toward what God has told us. Every single day. If it's making a phone call, if it's, if it's getting up in the morning and putting on your clothes when you don't feel like it and getting ready, even though you may deal with depression, wake up and stand up and get up out of bed and do something. Take a step. And you know, as you take that step, that's walking by faith. That's walking, that's getting up, and that's moving ahead. And not to lie down and quit, but to get up and walk. And I just believe that that's a word for someone in here this morning, that you've wanted to quit, you've wanted to stop, you've wanted to give up. But faith, faith doesn't lie down and quit. It lay holes, and it gets up, and it runs with the vision. So all I have to say, <clears throat> amen. Amen. <laughs> You know, that reminds me of something Brother Rick said last week when Jesus was speaking to the man at the pool of Bethesda, and he asked him that question, do you want to be made well? It's a simple question, isn't it? And it should have had a simple answer, yes, and yes, please. But as soon as Jesus asked that man, do you want to be made well? He launched into the excuses. He said, well, I don't have anybody. I don't have anybody to put me into the pool, right? When the water's stirred, somebody else gets in there before I do. And so often, too often, the excuses start. And do you notice, just like that man at the pool, so, much of, so many of our excuses have to do with other people. They have to do with what other people are not doing for us or what other people have done to us. And, and I can't have that and I can't be that. Well, why not? Because of them, because of what they did, because of what they said, because of how they treated me, because of the house I grew up in, because of the neighborhood I grew up in. You hear all these excuses, all these things people use as limiting factors to their vision. When Jesus told them, well, here's what you're going to have to do if you want to be made well. He gave them three things. Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And that's exactly what Sarah's talking to us about right now. Sometimes you just got to get up. Being made well, being made whole requires us get up. Get up out of whatever you've been lying down in, whatever you've been, for lack of a better word here, wallowing around in. Get up out of that. Come on, somebody say, get up. Yeah. You got to get up. And if you got to get up on the inside first, before you can get up on the outside, then do that. Get up on the inside. This is what she's talking to us about. He said, take up your bed. Quit, quit depending on that thing. Quit leaning on that as a crutch. Quit letting that bed of sickness, that bed of depression, that bed of oppression be your identity. That thing no longer holds you. You pick that up, Jesus said. And then what did he tell him to do? Walk. What a step of faith that is. Literally to walk by faith out of whatever mess we've been in and walk out of it in Jesus' name. Today, I'm taking my first step out of this sickness. I'm taking my first step out of this poverty and this lack, and I'm going towards what God has called me to do. So what Sarah just outlined for us is really the simplicity of the vision list that the Lord's asked us to do, what we're asking you to do. And it's so simple. It's these three categories. Number one, kingdom first. 
kingdom first. Asking ourselves, what are we going to put into the kingdom of God? Raise your hand if you had never before, like five minutes ago, heard of Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God. Raise your hand if you've never heard that verse before. If that is brand new information to you, ushers help. No hands. What does that mean? We've all heard that. But how many of you know there's a difference between what we've heard and what we put into practice? And so much of the time we can deceive ourselves thinking that because we've heard it, we're doing it. But that's not always the case. So when you approach that first category as a family, what are we putting into the kingdom of God this year? Don't assume that you're seeking first the kingdom just because you heard Jesus say that verse before. Look for the ways that you're doing it. One of the things that she and I do, what it means for us to seek first the kingdom of God, we're tithers. And I know that's become, oddly, a very controversial subject. <laughs> it's not controversial at all. Read your Bible. Well, that's under the law. Read the Bible. Before the law, during the law, after the law. We're tithers. That means we take the first ten. Not just a 10%, the first 10% of what comes into our personal lives, into our family, and we set that aside. And now we're, and we add to it, we add to it. And like she said, each passing year, we're pressing to, towards more. We're believing God to stretch and to do more for the kingdom in 2023 than we've ever done before. And he's helping us with that. And we've written some things down. You might want to write down an amount. You might want to write down a percentage. Lord, I'm, I'm committing to you and to your kingdom this percentage this year. And, and there's a reason we don't tell you specifically what those numbers are for us. is because you don't need to be comparing yourself to anyone or anything else. You do what the Lord tells you to do. So how do we know if we're seeking first the kingdom of God? Well... What if somebody didn't know you, didn't know your faith, your religion, your, nothing about you, and all they had as a glimpse into your life was your financial records and how you spent your time? Would they know that you're a believer? Would they know that you are committed to the kingdom of God? Do your finances tell that story? Does how you spend your time, effort, and energy tell the story that you're a believer? This is how we know, are we seeking first the kingdom of God? So I'm asking you, take some time with that as a family. Let's, let's not just glance over it and, and be guilty of thinking that we're doing it without actually putting it into practice. So what did she say after that? She said, know your debts and obligations. And I want this to be real to you because this is what we're going to release faith on. I want to give you just a few verses on that here in just a minute. But be specific. Be honest and be specific. You're not debt free because you pretend you're debt free. Know what you owe. There's scriptures that deal with us about that. Know the state of your flocks. Know what you owe. You can't release faith to be out of debt and debt free if you're not even sure what you owe. So be specific about it. Know what you owe. And notice these are the two things that come before you and I believe in big. Because we put first the kingdom of God and, and after that, we make good on our word. When you signed that loan or you, when you used that credit card, what you were saying is, I will pay for this. <laughs> Man, it's quiet. I, I'm going to pay for this. You're putting your word on the line. You're putting your name and your identity on the line. And you're saying, I'm committing to this. So before we start doing a bunch of stuff for ourselves and before we start, you know, um, adding to ourselves all these things we desire, we put the kingdom first and we make good on our word. And then we release faith to see God do big things in our lives, things that we couldn't do on our own, things that are outside of our own ability but not outside of our faith. That's an important distinction. So that's how you make a vision list. Um, if you need a refresher on any of that, this message today is going to be online. And if you want to as a family, go back, sit down and watch exactly what we just said. Go over this and do it with your children. They need to see you do this. They need to witness you believe God in big ways. And then you 
need to ask them what they're believing for and then get ready, get ready, get ready. Because they are going to make your vision look pitiful. Ask me how I know. We have done this with our kids so many times. We did it when we were moving up here to Colorado. Okay, guys, we're moving out of this house in Texas. We're going to have to have a house in Colorado. What do we desire from the Lord? And we told them, make your list. We told them, what do you want in a house? And they went away and they wrote down what they're believing God for. And they brought it back to us and we thought, ha, I'm not even sure they do that in Colorado, you know. I won't get into all the details, but the first house we looked at, and our real estate agent is in the house today and can tell you that I'm telling the truth. <laughs> the first house we looked at met every one of their vision requirements. And some things that Sarah and I had written down about what we desired in a house. Very specific things. We drove up on the property. We walked around and we said, well, this is it. I think we might have gone to look at one other house and I remember being in there going, what are we doing here? <laughs> we already found it. This is, this is powerful stuff. Get your kids involved in this. So is everybody clear on how to do that? And your kids today are being given a pamphlet, I believe, in service. Is that right? Do I have that right? Are we doing that today? And they are bringing home something they can write their vision list in. So don't scoff at anything they say. Don't laugh at it. Don't roll your eyes. Don't, don't try to explain away why God can't do that. Don't you dare do that. And don't look to yourself as their source. Let them trust God. Amen? When we talk about vision, what we're really talking about is the call of God on our lives. And this is what makes us different. And this is a distinction and a defining line between us and the rest of this world. Do you realize that God put inside every person, whether saved or unsaved, the capacity for vision? He put inside man the ability to see. But not just see what's right around them, not just look at their present circumstances or their current condition. God put within every person, listen, saved or unsaved, the ability to see beyond all that. This is why there are countless stories down through history, stories we love to tell and retell about people who were born into abject poverty, people who were born into nothing and obscurity, but they saw beyond it and they believed something bigger, and they pressed towards that, and their lives became living examples of the vision they saw before they ever saw anything in the natural. God put that in somebody. Now, I wish I could sit here and tell you, well, that only happens for Christians. I wish I could say that only happens for God-fearing and God-believing people. But you and, I know, you and I both know that's not true. There are people who don't give God the time of day who have big vision. And have seen those big things come to pass. So what's the difference between us and them? What's the difference between what we're telling you to do and what they do on a regular basis? There are unbelievers that every day write the vision. There are unbelievers who are the heads of huge corporations that are making millions and even billions of dollars. And they are putting these very practices in, they're putting them into practice, writing the vision, putting it up in front of people. People are running with it and it's working. So there's got to be a difference, right? There better be. There's supposed to be a difference between us and them. What's the difference between our so-called vision and their vision? The difference is where it comes from. And you're familiar with this verse. You don't have to turn there and look at it. But in Proverbs 29, 18, it says, without vision, what happens? People perish. But other translations say it like this. Without revelation, people cast off restraint. That's the difference. When we talk about vision, we're not just talking about things we sit around and dream up. We're talking about things that come to us as the result of divine revelation. 
Not something you made up, not something you dreamed up, not some vision you have for your life, but a vision, a revelation that God has given you about who you are and what you are, listen to this word, called to. This is the big difference. When we talk about vision, we're talking about our callings. Now, I know that if I were to ask for a show of hands and if I were to say, who in here knows at least a little bit about what you're called to? I believe there are hands that would go up all over this place. And I do believe there's probably some, if I were to say, are you still looking for that? Are you not sure what that is? If you were honest, there'd probably be some that say, yeah, you know what? I'm on this planet, but I'm not yet sure why. Looking for that calling. See, we're all in different places with it. But there are two distinct parts of our callings. And I use that word today interchangeably for the word vision. There are two distinct parts of our calling. And I think sometimes we're guilty of focusing on only one of them. And it's asking this question, what am I called to do? You ever asked that question before? Come on, any hands in here? You ever asked that question, what am I called to do? Yeah, we have. What am I called to do? And that's an important question. You need to ask it and you need to answer it. Why? Because you will never be, are you listening to me? You will never be more satisfied doing anything other than the thing you're called to do. You can try a bunch of different stuff. You can try a little of this and a little of that. But if it's not the thing that God's called you to do, it will leave you with this dissatisfied feeling on the inside. Nothing satisfies more than doing the thing that God's called you to do. So that's an important question to ask and answer. What am I called to do? But have you noticed we tend to just kind of focus on that? When we think about our callings, we think, well, what am I called to do? Sarah and I, what are we called to do? I believe we are called to sit right here where we are today. I believe we are called to pastor. These are, this is the thing we are called to do. But there is another part to your calling. And it's such a critical part that I honestly believe it comes before knowing what you're called to do. And it's asking this question, what am I called to be? Knowing what you're called to be actually comes before knowing what you're called to do. Knowing what you're called to do will come out of a revelation of what you're called to be. So, wherever you are in that spectrum of of the revelation of your calling, where I, I know with certainty what I'm called to do, I see it clearly, I'm pursuing it, or maybe you're down on the other end of the spectrum and you're like, I don't have a clue what he's put me here to do. Wherever you are in that, what we want to do today is first answer this question, what am I called to be? And if you look throughout the scriptures, it's very clear what God has called us to be. He has called us to be sons and daughters. That's your calling. I said, that's your calling. You are called to be a son or a daughter of God. And whatever he's called you to do comes out of what he's called you to be. If I try to be, or try to, excuse me, try to do this calling of of pastoring without this revelation of being a son of God, trying to pastor is going to be hard, man. It's going to be frustrating, challenging. I first need a revelation. Jeremy, your calling on this earth is to be his son. You need a revelation. You're called to be his son, to be his daughter. But I want to center in on one thing today that the Lord has called you to be. And I want to put this on the screen for you. This is out of the book of Galatians, chapter 5. Look at verse 13. We're going to look just at the first, verse, uh, excuse me, the first part of this verse. He says, you, my brothers, this is the NIV, you, my brothers and sisters, were called, do you see that word? You were called to be, say it with me, Free. 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 This is what you are called to be. What is God's vision for my life? Well, God's vision for you 
is to be free. This is his vision for you and for all mankind. You are called to be free. The Amplified Classic translation says it like this. You, brethren, were indeed called to freedom. This is your calling. As much or even more so than anything you were called to do, you were called to be free. Called to be free. Can you say that with me? I am called to be free. Let's say it all together. I am called to be free. That's the calling of God on my life, to be free. And it's been the calling and the vision that God has had for mankind since day one. When he created man and put him in the garden, Adam and Eve, the first thing God gave them was freedom. He said, of any of the trees in the garden, you may freely eat. He gave them freedom. But you and I both know, he said, there's one there, though, that you don't need to eat of. It's that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And people down through human history have thought, well, if that was true, and if God really is God and all-knowing, then why even put the tree there to begin with? If God didn't want them to eat it, why put it there to start with? And it goes back to what I've already said. He gave them freedom. If you don't have a choice, the question then becomes, are you really even free? He had to give them a choice so that he could establish you're free. You are free to choose. And we all know what happened. What happened? Adam gave away our freedom. And in so doing, he enslaved himself, his wife, his family, and all of us. He enslaved us to sin. Because the Bible says when sin entered, death entered. He enslaved us to sin. He enslaved us to death. But glory to God. Thank God for Jesus. The first thing Jesus came to get back for us was what? Our freedom. Our freedom. The Bible says Christ has redeemed us. That word literally means to purchase our freedom. It's the same word used if someone were to purchase a slave and then not enslave them, but set them free. That word redeemed is what it's talking about there. And that's what Jesus did. He purchased us out of slavery, but not to enslave us, to liberate us. To give us our freedom back. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. For what? For our freedom. And you know that Jesus said this in John chapter 8. He, the Bible said he spoke to those that believed on him and said, if you will uh, be a doer of my word, if you'll hear my word, if you'll be a disciple, he said, you will know the truth. And what would the truth do for you? Make you free. But do you know if you keep reading there that everybody who heard that said to him, what are you talking about free? They said, we're sons of Abraham. We never been in bondage to anybody. Is it possible to be in bondage and have no idea you're in bondage? Yeah. I mean, it's bad enough to be in prison and know you're in prison. It's far worse to be in prison and think you're free. That's what was going on with these people. They said, what are you talking about? We're free. And Jesus says, no, you're not free until the Son sets you free. Then you're free. And the Bible says in the book of Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty or the freedom by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. What's he saying? I've set you free. Don't go back to prison. I, I rescued you out of that. I rescued you out of slavery. Now don't put yourself back into it. Why? Because you're called to be free. Thank you, Lord. I want you to open to the book of Luke, chapter 4. And you just jump right in. Whatever the Lord has for you to say, just go for it. Luke, chapter 4. And I want to look at verse 18 together. 
And I want to show you that this is God's vision for you. This is his call on your life. What are you called to? Freedom. What are you called to? Everybody say it. Freedom. Freedom. I'm called to freedom. God's vision for my life is to be completely free. And those people Jesus said that to, what they say? We're, we're sons of Abraham. We've never been in bondage. You realize people in our country especially say the same thing. What are you talking about free? I'm an American. I'm, one of, I'm, the, I'm as free as you can get. Well, we need to be thankful for the freedoms that we have as citizens of this country. Grateful for it. But the kind of freedom that Jesus bought and paid for for us is not the kind of freedom that a government can give you. And it's not the kind of freedom that a government can take away. And for you and I to be truly free, we've got to be set free by the Son. In Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 18, listen to the words of Jesus. He said, and we'll have this on the screen. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Stop right there. What do you know about where the Spirit of the Lord is? There's what? There's freedom there. That's what the Scripture says. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me, now listen, to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty or freedom to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at, what? Liberty, those who are oppressed. I want you to notice, number one, What Jesus is saying is his whole job description and why God sent him to us to begin with. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is on me and it's for this reason. He's anointed me. Now, if you know anything about the anointing, you know that it is literally the burden removing, yoke destroying power of God. That's what the anointing does. That's what happens when the anointing hits somebody. It removes burdens. It destroys yokes. And it's why Satan is so terrified of it. It's why it makes him so angry. Because Satan will work for generation after generation to build a burden so big in the life of an individual or a family or whole groups of people. And he's so terrified of the anointing. Why? Because one moment under the anointing can totally remove that burden and destroy that yoke. And his whole thing is building burdens, and God's whole thing is destroying burdens. Our enemy is literally in the the better burden building business. He is the head of the better burden bureau. This is what he is trying to do nonstop in people's lives. And Jesus, glory to God, was and is anointed to lift the burden and destroy the yoke. Somebody say amen. Amen. Now look at what he said are the burdens and the yokes he came to destroy and how he destroys them. He said, I'm anointed. The Spirit's on me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to who? The poor. That should tell you right away that poverty is not a blessing. And it is not the plan. It is not the will. Hey, it's not God's vision for your life. Poverty is not his vision. If it were, Jesus wouldn't preach the gospel to it. But the preaching of the gospel, the anointed preaching of the gospel, has the ability to lift that burden and destroy that yoke of poverty. Amen. Amen. Now this word poverty, you look it up and it literally means to be a beggar or to be a pauper. It means to be destitute of wealth or influence, position, or honor. It means to be helpless. It means being powerless. It actually means lacking anything. Jesus, his vision for your life is not lack. And yet most people so identify with their lack, with their helplessness, with their poverty, that their vision never stretches beyond it. But I can look beyond it when I realize, hey, that's not God's vision for me. God's vision for me is not lack. God's vision for me is not helpless. God's vision for me is not poverty. Jesus came to preach to that mess and destroy that yoke. Amen? 
He said he sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Living with a broken heart is not God's vision for your life. And yet so many people are so wounded, so broken on the inside that it has become their identity and it is their vision. They cannot see beyond the broken heart. And as a result, it's affecting and impacting every relationship. It affects every decision they make within every relationship, whether it's a marriage relationship or the relationship a parent has with their children or even their friendships and relationships at work. The broken heart, if that's their vision and identity of who they are, there is nothing but bitterness that flows out of a broken heart and it affects every relationship. And Jesus said, I came to heal that because my vision for you is not you living with a broken heart. Thank you, Lord. He said he's also anointed to proclaim liberty to the captives. This word captive literally means a prisoner of war. It's an interesting word. Within it is the word translated spear. In other words, somebody that's being held at the point of a spear. We might, be, say, we might say being held at knife point or gun point. This is somebody who's captive. And Jesus said, that's not my vision for you. My vision for mankind is that you'd be free from captivity. To preach recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty or freedom all who are oppressed. This word oppressed means beat down, broken, and shattered. Come on, church. This is not God's vision for us. But this right here, everything Jesus listed, from poverty to brokenheartedness to captivity, blindness of heart, oppression, this is the state that all mankind is in until they meet Jesus. This is the condition that every human is in unless and until they meet Jesus. I don't care how much money you have in the bank. If you don't know Jesus, you're in poverty. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is the condition mankind was in as the result of what Adam gave away. He gave away our freedom and enslaved us to poverty, enslaved us to brokenheartedness, imprisoned us to blindness and captivity and oppression. Jesus came to lift that burden and destroy that yoke. I think this is better preaching than your amen. Come on. You're called to be what? Free. You're called to be free of all of this. Thank you, Lord. Now, Jesus didn't stop there, and this is what I want to focus on just for the next few minutes. He went on in verse 19 to say that the Spirit of the Lord was on him. He was anointed, verse 19, to proclaim... The acceptable year of the Lord. Now that word proclaim is the exact same word he used in verse 18 when he said preach. Jesus said, I'm anointed to preach the gospel. I'm anointed to preach recovery of sight. I'm anointed to preach liberty. What did Jesus go around preaching? Freedom. You want to know what Jesus preached? He preached freedom. God's will for man to be free. He said it right here. I'm anointed to preach and proclaim freedom. And then he said this in verse 19. I'm anointed to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. I like the, the Wiest translation of this. He said, I'm anointed to herald forth. This is what it means to preach. To proclaim it like what I'm doing right now. To lift my voice to shout some things out. He said, I'm anointed to herald forth that epochal period of time which the Lord has chosen and in which he takes pleasure. Jesus was anointed to preach about this time. Now, we've talked about this word before, but let me just mention it to you again. This word epochal, E-P-O-C-H-A-L, what does it mean? It means the beginning of a new development, of a new era in time. It's something that occurs, a, an event that occurs that marks the beginning of a new way of life. I always talk about September 1st, 2007 as an epochal moment in my life. 
You want to know what that day was? The day I married Sarah Hart. That day, that event marked a whole new way of life for me. A couple of years later, we had another epochal moment in our lives. When our first child was born, that changed everything. Life was one way before that and completely different afterwards. An epochal moment. Do you remember life before the children? I don't either. I know we had one, but I don't, I don't remember. I think there's pictures of it, but I don't remember it. Staying up late, watching TV, going to get an ice cream just because we wanted to. I don't remember that at all. That's what happens as the result of an epochal moment. It marks the beginning of a new way of life. But how many of you know, to mark the beginning of a new way, what else do you do? You mark the end of an old one. And for you to succeed in this new way of life, you have to quit living the old way. And when Jesus said, hey, I'm anointed to preach to you, man, it caught these people's attention. I'm anointed to preach the gospel to you. I'm anointed to proclaim healing to you and recovery of sight to you. I'm anointed to preach freedom to you. And then he said, I'm anointed to proclaim and to preach this epochal moment, the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, to understand what that even means, you've got to go back to the Old Testament. And in the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, I'm not going to take time to read the whole thing to you. Let me just summarize for you exactly what Jesus was talking about. Other translations said that Jesus said it like this. I'm here to preach the, the favor of the Lord. He was referring to a specific year, the acceptable year of the Lord. And it was called in the Old Testament, the year of Jubilee. Now that word Jubilee in the Hebrew is a, is a word that literally meant the sounding of a trumpet. It meant the continuous sounding, the proclamation. It was, uh, it, it literally meant the continuous sound of a horn blast. And listen, I'll just read this to you. It says, the year of Jubilee that Jesus is talking about was a holy year, consecrated and set apart to proclaim liberty and freedom to all people. That's what this year was about. This year, somebody said, was an antidote to poverty, slavery, and bondage. What year? This Jubilee year. This acceptable year of the Lord's favor. This thing that Jesus went around preaching to everybody. It was a year of freedom. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 7, that the rich shall rule over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. Now, anytime you owe a debt, you literally become servant to the lender. And in the Old Testament times, if you had a debt, a financial debt that you couldn't pay, you literally became a servant or a slave to the person that you owed money to. That's why this verse says that the borrower is servant to the lender. And you became that person's slave and you lost all control of your property. You lost all control of your assets. You lost all your freedom until that debt could be paid. Now the year of Jubilee, this acceptable year of the Lord that Jesus went around preaching, this was a sacred, sacred year because it was a year. Oh, come on. Get ready to shout. It was a year of release when debt-induced servanthood ended. You ready for this? All debts and mortgages were canceled. Why? Year of Jubilee. This acceptable year of the Lord. Every 50th year. Any land that had been sold was returned to its original owner. Everyone was given a fresh start in business free from the bondage of debt. What did Jesus go around preaching? Freedom. He went around preaching freedom from poverty. He went around preaching freedom from a broken heart. Preaching freedom 
from spiritual blindness, and we see in his ministry even natural blindness. He healed people of it over and over again. He preached people's freedom from captivity, freedom from oppression, and, and he preached the acceptable year of the Lord, which was what? Total debt freedom. The way God created us to live. Thank you, Lord. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. This is God's vision for us. How do I say it, Lord? His vision for you is to owe no man anything but to love him. And there are people who are trapped, locked up in the prison of debt. Cannot see beyond the debt they owe. And the debt is so big, it's so weighty, it's so, it's so heavy, whether it's credit card or mortgage or car or consumer debt of any kind, they can't see themselves free of it. Well, I have good news for you this morning. God sees you free of it. I said, God sees you free of that. He sees you free from the burden and bondage of debt of any kind. This is what's acceptable to him. Amen. So Jesus identified for us here what we are to be free from. God's vision of us free from these things. Can you get a vision of this? I, I saw a head nod and maybe heard a grunt. It doesn't matter what God's vision for you is if you can't see it. So let me ask you again. Can you get a vision of yourself free? And I'm not just talking about the, the, the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights. I'm not just talking about those freedoms. I'm talking about being set free by the Son of God. Who's, who, when the Son sets you free, then you are truly free. Can you get a vision of yourself free? If you've been, if you've identified as poor, lacking, not having enough, helpless, can you get a vision of yourself free from poverty? There you go. Can you get a vision of yourself free from the broken heart? Because if you can't see it, it'll stay broken from now to the end of your life. But God's vision for you is healed spirit, soul, and body. Can you get a vision of yourself free from whatever's held you captive? If it's an addiction, if it's something that you have not been able to shake free of in any area of your life, and it feels like you make a little progress in it, then you fall right back into it. Or you make a little progress and then you, oh, you mess up again. Can you get a vision of yourself so completely free that that thing never troubles you, never bothers you, never slows you down again for another day in your life? This is what you're called to. This is the calling of God on your life to be free. What about debt free? I'm just going to give you a nice pause here. What about debt free? Hmm? What about you don't owe anything on your credit card? What about you don't owe anything to the IRS? Huh? Can you get a vision of the freedom? What about you don't owe any medical bills? How about them student loans? Can I get a shout from anybody? There you go. Is this not a hot topic today? And what's everybody doing? Well, I think the government should pay my loan. Wrong vision. Wrong vision. Government's not your source. Oh, come on. Do I need to stand up? Is that the thing? Is that what I got to do? Wave my arm. I'm anointed to preach this stuff. Now, do you realize just me saying that is enough to make people mad? But I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway. The same spirit that anointed Jesus to preach freedom is on me to preach freedom to you today. 
The same spirit that was on Jesus that anointed him to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and freedom in every area of your life is on this woman of God. Now I'm going to make you real mad. You ready? The same spirit that anointed Jesus to preach freedom is on you. You're anointed with that same spirit. Glory to God. Freedom. So that's what we're free from. Now let's answer this question. What are we free for? We've been set free from a bunch of stuff, but what for? Huh? You go through the scriptures and you find out Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. And we don't even have time today or in a sermon every day for a month to go through everything that Jesus has set us free from just in the curse of the law. Under that curse includes our freedom from sickness. Under that curse includes our freedom from disease, our freedom from poverty, our freedom from lack, our freedom from mental oppression, our freedom from enemies, our freedom uh, through one thing right after the other. And Jesus has totally set us free from all of it. But the question is, what for? Has he healed your body so you can chill on the couch and watch TV? Totally free from pain. I mean, is that the big vision? Come on, we got to think bigger than that. Well, the answer is in the first scripture we looked at today. What are we free for? Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. Put that back up. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, and here's what your freedom's for, serve one another humbly in love. The Amplified Bible says, you brethren were indeed called to freedom. Only do not let your freedom be an incentive to your flesh and an opportunity or excuse for selfishness. This is where God's vision differs from the one you dream up. Most people, I dare say most of this world, that has accessed that God-given capacity for vision never learns to think beyond themselves. It's only about what their success can do for them. And there may be some that branch out beyond it a little bit, but I'm talking about a total different mindset and motivation behind wanting to be free. Is there anybody in here this morning that wants the kind of freedom I'm talking to you about? Well, leave your hand raised for a minute and let me ask you, what for? What, what, what if somebody came in today and said, all right, you're free. You are completely financially free. Just write down what you owe. I'll write a check. You're free. Now what? Do you realize most people would have no idea? Now what? And mankind has proven that over and over through the advent of the lottery. <laughs> case after case after case after case is an example of somebody who has no idea what to do with freedom. And studies and statistics even show us that men and women who spend time in prison, incarcerated, especially if they're in there for a long time, if parole comes up or by whatever means they are released and set free, do you know what a huge percentage of those men and women return back? Why? They don't know how to be free. They don't know what to do with the freedom. This is why he had to write to us and say, hey, Christ set you free, don't go back. Would you have to tell somebody don't go back to prison? Yeah. You have to tell them because it's the human nature to enslave ourselves again. But Jesus has set us free. And the question then becomes, all right, what's our freedom for? According to the word, our freedom is for service. I am free to love. 
First Peter chapter two, verse 16 in the Amplified Bible, he says, live as free people, yet without employing your freedom as a pretext for wickedness, but live at all times as servants of God. What is your freedom for? The reason I say this to you today is because you're going to go home and you're going to do what Sarah has instructed us today. You're going to make this vision list and you're going to get to that category, that section there in the middle. What do we owe? What do we believe in God to be free from financially? And I'm talking about debt, whether it's the debt you owe on your home, your car, consumer debt, write it all down. And the way I want you to approach section three is once I'm free from section two, what am I free for? What am I going to do with this freedom? And this is what we're going to spend our time talking about next week. I've got some direction. Sarah and I have some wisdom and direction from the Lord about what we're going to release faith for concerning the freedom, our financial freedom in this church. When we first looked at this property, many of you have heard us tell the story. We were still living in Texas. The Lord was leading our hearts up here to Colorado. We looked at a building in Colorado Springs that we thought might be it. It was about 100,000 square feet, had a sanctuary, had a television studio, had a bunch of offices. Honestly, it looked like it could really be it. But the closer we got to it and the more we were working with the owners on it, something just didn't seem quite right. And I'll be honest with you, it had a $6 million price tag on it. And I know my faith wasn't there. In talking with Sarah, we didn't have peace about believing God. Now, is God big enough to pay $6 million or is that too much for him? No, no, it's not about his ability. It's about you and I receiving according to our faith. This is why you've got to be honest. And you can't just say, well, you know, God can do anything. Six million, 10 million. Our faith wasn't there. So we took a step away from that. And in February of 2019, she and I did this exact thing right here. We got a couple of chairs in our living room, turned them to face the fireplace, and we just sat there. And we talked and we prayed and we turned the TV off and we turned off every other voice and we just said, Lord, what do you say? And I don't know, we spent, I think at least two days, we might've been in the third day of that. And the house we had there in Texas at the time was kind of an open floor plan. The kitchen opened up into the living room and, and late one afternoon, I think Sarah had gone into the kitchen to start making dinner that night. And I'm just sitting there by the fireplace praying. Honestly, just looking online, looking at properties for sale. And there was this one that popped up and man, it was rough. Dare I say ugly. It had no paved roads. It was just an old building sitting on top of a dirt hill. Had a lot of land, had some cabins, but they were in rough shape. And I sat there looking at it. And the only thing that occurred to me was, you know, Sarah and I, all those years ago, believing God to come to Colorado, we were looking at places with cabins. Huh. Coincidence, I guess. <laughs> and I got up from the chair and I walked around to the kitchen where she was standing at the sink and I had my phone and I said, you know, I saw this place the other day. I don't know. I don't know if it could be anything. And I showed it to her and she goes, that's it. She said, that's it. That's the place. And as soon as she said it, I was like, you're right. It is it. And long story short, you're sitting in it. This is what the Lord had for us. But we were so confident in that, that we took a step of faith, contacted a real estate agent and, and said, we want to make an offer on this building that we've never been to, <laughs> never seen except in these pictures. And long story short, they accepted our offer. That was millions of dollars. You know how many we had? How many millions of dollars we had? <laughs> Zero millions of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
But the Lord led us, and we got wisdom and counsel from our pastors, and we had a piece of property in Texas and contacted a bank, and the bank was willing to use our property as collateral. We had a lot of equity in it. We owned it debt-free, and, and so we didn't have to put anything down on it, and we got it. We made, made an offer on this property. We got not only the building and the land we're on right here, but what, what do we have now, 152 acres? It's the favor of God. And I grew up in a house, and some of you may know this, we were debt free, and it was a serious thing. My grandparents gave us that example, my mom and dad walked out that example in front of us as kids. I remember the day my parents paid off the house I grew up in, it was a big day. I also remember the day they gave that house away, totally free to somebody in our church. That makes a mark on a kid too. You gave our house away? <laughs> but I watched over and over as the Lord delivered our family out of debt, out of debt, miraculously fast over and over. And coming into this building, I thought, well, we're just gonna pay for this. We're just gonna believe God and pay the millions of dollars. And the Lord said, no, I want you to do it like this. And so we took that step of faith without really any money to speak of only using that building as collateral, got into this one. And our pastors invited us before we ever moved here to go minister in their church, present the vision of what we wanted to do here in Colorado. We got to tell the church about it. They received an offering for us that night and sowed a million dollars in one night into this place. That encourages you. In case that's never happened to you yet, it encourages you for somebody to say, here's a million, go do what the Lord tells you to do. And it has come up on our hearts strong in 2023 to see this place completely debt free. As a matter of fact, I believe I heard the Lord say it to me like this, debt free in 23. And I'm going to talk to you more about that next week. I want you to know it's coming. And the reason I'm saying it to you now is because next week we're going to receive an offering together. And it's going to go into our freedom project. But it's not just an offering to set this place free. You know how the Lord does this with us. When he tells us to release faith for something, the first opportunity he gives us is to sow a seed. And I've been spending all morning asking you, can you see yourself free? Well, the first thing you need to do is what? Sow a seed. That's what our offering next week is going to be about. It's going to be this initial seed that we sow into the ground to not only see this house paid for, but your house paid for. And I am fully expecting over the next several weeks, months, and even over the next few years, that glory stories are going to be pouring in. The Lord paid off our house. The Lord paid off our house. 20 years early, 25 years early, 15 years early. Man, I just thought there'd be a few more amens, but I'll let you sit in there. I'll let you think about it. So that's the direction we have concerning our vision for what's coming up. Now we'll go into more detail next week. And we're going to share some other things with you about it. And the thing I'm most excited to share with you about it, and this is what's going to have to stay a secret till next week, is not just what we're going to be from, for, or excuse me, free from, but what he is freeing us up for. Amen. This is where it gets exciting. Yes. And the freer we get from the debt on this place, the freer we become to love and minister and serve not only this family, but people outside our four walls. Amen. Amen. I did all the talking. What, what do you have? I think that this morning, um, whenever I started to pray for the service, I heard this, and I didn't even know what you were going to talk about totally. I heard, and I wrote it down, uh, unforgiveness is a prison. Mm. And how there are just a few things that can hold us back from walking out the vision that God gives us this year. And one of those things can be an unforgiveness in deep down in the heart.
and toward people. And you know what unforgiveness is? It's refusing to let to release a debt. That's right. And and in uh, Matthew, uh, it says uh, when we, it, Jesus tells us how to pray, and he says. Um, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And, you know, Jeremy and I, when we first had, we owned our first home, we heard the Lord speak to us and say to us, I want you to pay this thing off. I want you to be debt free from this house. And, you know, it didn't even seem logical to pay this house off in the natural. It did not make any money sense. It did not make financial sense. But we heard the Lord say, pay this house off. So we begin to seek him about it. How do we do that, Lord? How do we even fathom receiving, you know, funds to to pay this place off? And the first thing he told us was to forgive someone who owed us a debt. Now they owed us a financial. They owed us money. We had we had let them borrow. We had lended to them money. And he told us, forgive them that debt, that financial debt. Well, this works also in the soul and in the heart to release people and forgive them from what you think that they owe you. Set you completely free to believe God, to trust God, to put your faith in him, not looking to man to do it for you, not looking to man to meet your, your needs. Even if that's a love need or a, a, a anything on the inside. No, we look to God. We trust God to meet every need, even in our souls. And when you start to say that, you know, I even say this to the Lord sometimes. I say it out loud. Maybe it's for myself. That person owes me nothing. That's right. They owe me nothing. I am not entitled to anything from anyone. Come on. I trust God with every part of my life. I trust him to make a way for me. I trust him to open doors for me that no man can close. I trust him to put me in front of the right people at the right time in the right places. I trust him to pay off everything I need to pay off. I trust him to be the Lord of my life. I do not depend depend on anyone else. They owe me nothing. I forgive that debt. Even if you think that they've done you wrong, even if you think they, and maybe they have, maybe they have done the wrong thing toward you. I choose to forgive. I choose to release that debt. I choose to let it go. And you know, I go free. I wrote this down this morning. This is a quote by C.S. Lewis. And he said this, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. Yeah. And you know what? That's what unforgiveness is. It's a prison. People have been bound up. They have been they have been stuck. They feel stuck. Have you ever felt stuck? They have felt like they can't go any further in life, that this is their lot, that they can't even get free. But so much of that they don't know is bitter. It is, is them being behind bars of bitterness. Yeah. And they have held themselves hostage, held themselves within a prison. And that prison has become a limiting factor in being who God has called them to be, in doing what God has called them to do, in serving one another with love. Unforgiveness, it is a prison. That's right. But when you forgive, you release debts. You just start releasing debts everywhere. You let people, you let it go. You let everything go. You go free. Yeah. And you, you begin to live again. You know, when Rick said that last week, he said, how, this is how you get your life back. Yeah. This is how you get your life back. That's right. You forgive, you forgive debt. You release people. You know what? You know what this takes? It takes faith. It takes faith that I trust God enough that he can deal with them, that he can handle this situation. 
I'm not bound up by what man does to me. I'm free to love. I'm free to serve. I'm free to give. I'm telling you, forgiving a debt sets you free. And it unlocks the prison doors. This is how Jesus, our master, lived. Father, forgive them. That's right. Thank you. For they know not what they do. Yeah. I just believe this is a first step in even financial debt freedom. That's the truth. Let it go in your soul. Stop holding a grudge. Stop holding on to that bitterness. Holding on to that grudge is what is keeping you from doing all that God has for you. Yeah. This will set you free. Let's stand up together, church. When the Lord told Sarah and I to pay off that little house, we owed $119,000 on it. And we released faith together to be debt free, and it started coming in. <laughs> Extra started coming in, coming in, coming in. Told, called mm-hmm. that person and said, You don't owe us anything. Well, the, it got to a point where it seemed like it kind of slowed down. We had gotten it down to about $75,000 left. And uh, in September, the Lord dealt with us that year, released that debt. And he was the one that led us to give it to him in the beginning. <laughs> and he said, release that debt. So in September of that year, we contacted those people and said, you don't owe us anything. And it was about $5,000. In October, one day in October, the rest of that money to pay off the house came in in a day. And we were debt free like that. After releasing the debt. One, one day, years later, she and I were going to minister in uh, Arkansas, I think. And we were driving out of Texas through Oklahoma. And we we're just driving along kind of countryside. And I saw a sign on the side of the road that said, hitchhikers may be escaping inmates. And I thought, well, that's ominous. <laughs> What's that about? Well, about a quarter mile later on the other side of the road, We'd go passing this huge facility surrounded by razor wire fence, 20 feet tall. There's a prison. So the sign was warning me, hey, don't pick anybody up because they may have gotten out of there. But you know what? I couldn't stop thinking about that sign. The whole rest of that day and the rest of that weekend, I actually preached in Arkansas on that sign. Hitchhikers may be escaping inmates. And I began to see from the Lord and from the Word things that have held people in prison. Things like poverty and brokenheartedness and unforgiveness and fear and debt. And I'm going to say to you the same thing that I said to that congregation that that morning. I believe I'm looking at a room full of escaping inmates today. Amen, anybody? Glory to God. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed this message. If you need someone to pray with you, there are several ways for you to contact us. Feel free to give us a call at 817-577-0180. You can also contact us through the Legacy Studios app or either of our websites. Giving options are available online at pearsonsministries.com and legacychurch.family. If you prefer, you can also text an offering. Simply text LEGACY in any dollar amount to the number 28950 and follow the prompts. Be blessed today. We love you. And remember, you are always welcome here in the House of Faith.